Chapter 15. Parry and Thrust Thanos felt that the entire weight of the Kingdom of Yodia now rested on his shoulders, and he did not like it one bit. Four months had passed since the fateful argument, and in that time, there was no sign of Mishra. He had vanished from the palace, and the Falaji, the dragon engine, and his war machine had vanished from the gate soon after midnight. The Falaji had been prepared for their departure. Of that, Thanos had no doubt. Mounted scouts were dispatched that evening up and down the river, but there was no sign of them. Urza had to wait for morning to dispatch the Ornithopters, and that was when the scouts had discovered that a ferry barge upriver had been seized and sunk on the far bank. The assumption was that Misha and his engines had fled west in the trains marred on territories that bordered on Falaji territory. Then from the east came a report that a collection of brass helmets and Falaji gear had been found by a farmer, indicating that Misha's forces were making instead for the Kerr ridges. Soon after, a horseman arrived from the sword marches, declaring that a great metallic beast had been spotted there, moving only at night and heading north. Military units were shunted first one way, then another in response to each new rumor. To make matters worse, Urza took to the field with one of the ornithopter flights and moved continually from one site to the next. It had been four months, and Urza had still not returned to Krug, nor sent any message to his wife, the Queen. Thanos received numerous orders for new developments and changes to the ornithopter design, and instructions for coordinating the production of a line of Avenger-style automatons. But these messages were always technical in nature, without a hint of curiosity about Thanos' own well-being, nor that of Urza's wife, nor the situation in the capital. The last was deteriorating quickly. A rumor had spread that the chief artificer's evil brother was hiding among the Falaji traders still in the city, plotting an insurrection. The resulting riots killed 17 Falaji, including, Thanos had heard, one of the musicians who played at the banquet. Those with ties to the desert fled the city and other Yodian cities as quickly as possible. This created another rumor, that the first rumor had been planted by Misha so he and his men could escape in the confusion. The resulting violence overmatched the capabilities of the temples to cope as resources earmarked for study and supplies were suddenly diverted to the homeless and the wounded. The priests clamored for more of the magical talismans Urza had created early in his career there, but the artificer was not present to create them. Thanos heard that people were now beginning to doubt their leaders. If Urza was so wise, ran the common table, why could he not find his own brother in his wife's own land? Either Urza was not as smart as the people had thought, which was unsettling, or Mishra was much smarter, which was even more troubling. Now, rumors of invasion of the sword marches or the trans territories were regular fare in the inns and taverns, and many of the merchants spoke of relocating to the coastal provinces for the duration of the hostilities. Indeed, there was some confusion among the common folk about what exactly happened at the end of the conference. The general story was that Urza and his brother came to blows, but the nature of the argument was not clear. Some said it was about the sword marches. Another story was that Urza had accused Mishra of stealing his ideas and making his dragon engines. No, it was the other way around, others said. Urza had stolen the idea of the ornithopters from his brother. There were a few comments about Kayla herself, but those were only voiced by low individuals in shadowy bars and were given no credence or at least Thanos hoped that was the case. The confused mood of the city was matched by that in the palace. The captain of the guard was frantic, as his orders were regularly countermanded by those of Urza from the field. The seneschal, who had warmly welcomed to the Falaji, was now frantically trying to prove that he was as tough as the old warlord himself had been. The queen kept her quarters, and would see a select number of people using the matron as a last line of defense against intruders. She would speak to the seneschal, the captain of the guard, and Thanos, and not to anyone else. Unfortunately, for the remnants of the Privy Council, most of her commands were along the lines of do as you see fit, superseded only by what would Urza want. And to make matters worse, the matron had informed Thanos, through numerous allusions and euphemisms, that her majesty was in the family way. Indeed, when Thanos spoke with the queen, she seemed more haggard and tired than usual. Thanos sent Urza a gently worded dispatch detailing Kayla's condition, but received in return a list of corrections to the armature of the Avengers. Thanos could not understand the coldness of Urza's response until he did the math. Given the phases of the Mist Moon and the advancement of Kayla's pregnancy, she would have had to have conceived sometime during the week of the meetings with the Falaji, probably toward the end of that week, before Urza left the city. Urza had departed hot on the heels of Mishra. Thanos did not like to consider what that might mean, but he had no doubt Urza realized that once. And there was the last problem of Ashnod, still held hostage in the guest wing of the palace. All attempts to contact the Falaji to negotiate her release had failed. A number of people wanted her executed for crimes that remained as fuzzy as the explanation of what happened between Urza and Mishra. The staff, with its sickening energies, had been a surprise to Thanos, 
and the guards had stripped her room of anything with which she might be able to make a weapon. The staff remained in Tanos' care. The device itself was a beautiful creation, and he sought permission from the queen to speak with Ashot about it. At least, that was the excuse he gave Kayla. Where did you get the knowledge that helped you build the staff? He asked at one point. Was it an old text? A scholar? A wanderer from another land? Ashot remained perched on the windowsill, the morning sun shining resplendently on her hair. She said nothing. It will be easier if you talk, said Tanos. Keeping silence isn't going to get you anywhere. Ashnot's head snapped around to regard Tanos. Then she smiled and said, I've got a joke. Care to hear it? Tanos looked puzzled. Matron and the queen are talking. Matron says, whatever else you say about that Misha, at least he dresses well. And the queen says, yes, and quickly too. What do you think? That's not funny, sputtered Tanos. You know, there are temple inquisitors who have put themselves at our disposal just to wring your secrets out of you. But you're keeping them at bay, said Ashot, signing off her perch. And why is that, baby duck? Tonos bristled, but kept his voice calm. Because they might damage you. Any knowledge you have might be lost. I might choose to die with my secrets rather than betray Master Misha, sighed Ashot. You are so naive and so kind. No wonder you're the queen's favorite. What do you know? said Tonos, defensive again. Ashan waved her hand. There's not a lot to do here. So I listen. To the guards. To the chambermaids. The people outside the window. I think you're keeping me around because you need someone to talk to. Mama Duck Urza is gone, and poor Kayla is wrapped up in blaming herself. That's why you're here. Tonos did not reply, but kept his head on his chest, regarding the table. A long silence spread out between the two. Finally, Ashant sat down at the table across from Urza's apprentice. The way I see it, it's a question of approach, she said at last. Her tone was calm, almost conversational. What is? Tonos responded. Ashant sighed and shook her head. The staff. Wasn't that what we were talking about? Among other things, said Tonos, the hurt still in his voice. Don't be like that, snapped Ashant. Look. Have you worked in a slaughterhouse? Tanos blinked. I worked as a fisherman once. Completely different, said Ashnod. Fish are low creatures, barely with the spine they have. If you work at sawing up carcasses, you notice how the joints fit, how the nerves are arrayed, and how the skin peels back. I have dissected creatures, said Tanos. Birds, for example, to study their wings for the ornithopters. But never one that was still alive when you cut into it. Correct? asked Ashnod. Tonos did not respond, but his face gave away his answer. Ashnod continued. As I said, there's a difference of approach. You and Mamadat Urza don't want to get your hands dirty, to deal with the blood and skin and muscle and nerves and fluids. You'd never have stumbled on the idea of frying an opponent's nerves with something like my staff. I don't know if that's a responsible goal, said Tonos. Beside the point, said Ashnod sharply, slapping the tabletop with her palm. Tano saw the fire in her eyes again, the inventing fire. You're looking at the birdwing and thinking about how to duplicate it. I'm looking at the birdwing and thinking about how to incorporate it, how to make it function again. If I were building ornithopters, I would have used rock wings. I would have kept them alive with their own blood and nutrients and tethered them to the housing. That is impossible, said Tanos. A girl can dream, said Ashnod, and smiled again. But I think that's what they did with the dragon engine. The original builders, I mean. They didn't try to duplicate a dragon with metal and cable like the old Thran would. Rather, they started with a dragon and built outward until the machinery replaced the dragon entirely. The fire blazed in the scarlet woman's eyes again. You can't be afraid of living things, or dead things for that matter, she said. Living tissue is one more set of tools we can use. If we only get past our backward concept that is somehow inviolate, we can truly make progress. She looked at Tanos and shrugged. That's what I think, at least. Misha might disagree. I think the answer is within the body, not outside it. The discussion had taken a disturbing turn for Tanos. In an effort to divert into other channels, he said, Where do you think Misha is now? Is there a special hiding place he has? Ashot shook her head. He doesn't need to hide right now. He has his brother right where he wants him, running all over the place looking for him. Was that his plan? 
asked Tonos. Ashad paused a moment, then shook her head. I don't particularly know that Misha had a plan. He's very good at setting up things, but then he throws caution to the winds and spins the wheel of fate. Madness, muttered Tonos. Or divine inspiration, countered Ashnod. So he didn't let you in on his plans, continued Tonos. If he did, would I be here, living in all this luxury? Ashnod waved her hands at the bare walls of her quarters. No, and it's not that he's secretive, though he is. I really don't think he had an exact plan when he came to Krug, but I do know he'd be happy with the result. Tonos sighed. I wish I could believe you. Ashnod frowned, then spread her hands. Look, I'll give you this one free of charge. Misha's not one to let an opportunity pass, and with Urza thoptering all of her creation, this is an opportunity for Misha to hurt his brother and hurt him bad. And the Kadir is such a hothead that he'll declare a full jihad at the drop of a brass hat. So something is coming. But you don't know what or where, said Tanos. Ashnot shrugged. One more thing then, she said. You wondered how I got the staff in here? Tanos said. I assume our guards relaxed during the festivities. Ashnot smiled. It was a dazzling smile. The black thunderwood staff I walked in with. You saw it on the first day. Who could deny a woman with her walking staff? The skull was smuggled in, but the gold wire was sewn into the hem of my bodice, and the power stones were brought in among my jewelry. Tonos looked at the tabletop. He had watched her assemble the weapon without realizing it. There's a point to this? Only this, said Ashot. All the components came together at the right moment to produce the staff. That's what's going to happen regardless of what it is. Everything will come together at once. And? She motioned with her hands. Boom! Tonos stood up. You've given me something to think about. Several things, in fact. Ashad rose with him. Yes, and one of the things will probably be, can I trust her? The answer is, no you can't, but you should at least listen, okay? Tonos nodded and turned toward the door. Ashad called out his name, and he turned back toward her. Ashad leaned forward and kissed the apprentice. Tonos started, as if prodded by a dagger thrust. Ashad ignored the reaction. That's thanks. Thanks for not turning me over to the temples. And thanks for coming and talking to me. You're a good duck. And she smiled. Outside, in the hall, Tonos rubbed his cheek where Ashnot had kissed him. The skin was still warm. Urza, muttered his apprentice. Wherever you are, you better get back here soon. Lieutenant Sharaman had the privilege of delivering the report to Chief Artificer Urza. He and another pilot had discovered Mishra's war machine at the center of a large encampment, three hours' flight to the west. It was the first sighting of one of Mishra's engines since the troops had begun this wild goose chase, and Sharman was delighted to finally see some results from their work. The Yodian Flyers were at their third base camp, each one pressing deeper into the enemy territory of the Great Desert. The sore marches were weeks away by foot, and everything at the camp had to be flown in. Sharman longed for the relative luxuries of the home base, hot meals, attentive women, and most of all, hot water to bathe in. However, mentioning such desires was a quick way to lose one's wings, and Sharaman would rather fly than have the attentions of the most attractive women in Yodia. Urza was seated beneath his tarp, hunched over a makeshift table. At the table was a hand-drawn map of the desert. In addition to pursuing his brother, the chief artificer was conducting the first true survey of this area. Evenings were filled with reports of hills, ridges, dry washes, and a number of curious rock piles that the prince consort referred to as Thran sites. Sharaman stepped beneath the tarp, clicked his heels, and saluted. Sire, we have a sighting of the great war machine. Urza did not look up from the map. Report, he said. A large encampment of tents, with the war machine at the center. Where? snapped Urza. A quarter's day flight from here, fifteen degrees south of due west. Urza traced the line Sharaman had defined. Yes, that would make perfect sense. If we had continued on our present line of attack, we might have missed it. My brother did not take into account wide lateral patrols, it seems. To the lieutenant, he said, Were you spotted? No signs, said Sharaman. They tend to hide from us now. Indeed, said Urza, raising one eyebrow. Best to assume they know we've spotted them, and they're likely to be already packing camp. Ready all the ornithopters. Take all the goblin bombs. Sire? asked Sharaman. Is there a problem, Lieutenant? 
The chief artificer looked up for the first time. His face was lined and drawn, more so than would be accounted for by the continual desert wind. It is late in the day, sire, said Charmon, choosing his words carefully. I am aware of the time, lieutenant, said Urza. His voice was icy. But if we wait for the morrow, Misha will be gone. It will be dusk before we arrive, protested the ornithopter pilot. It'll be midnight if we keep talking about it, snarled Urza. Now get to it. I want the entire patrol in the air in 15 minutes. Charlemagne stiffened, saluting smartly, and retreated. As the pilot left the tent, he was already bellowing orders to the other flyers and support staff. There was an immediate eruption of activity as the various artifice students beetled over the machines, making final preparations. Those pilots who had flown with Urza before had begun checking their machines as soon as they saw Sharaman head for the prince consort's tent. Sharaman did not like it. An evening attack was dangerous and meant either setting down in enemy territory for the night or risking treacherous night winds and cool spots on the flight back. Still, the chief artificer was not to be denied, particularly in the matter of his brother. They were ready in 10 minutes, five ornithopters plus Urza's own craft. All were the double bend wing design now, of the type in which Urza had flown to Corlinda. Urza's craft remained the best of the lot and was the best maintained. It had a wingspan half again as long as the others and carried twice as many of the dangerous goblin bombs. The latter had been flown all the way from the sword marches and were kept cool and wrapped in damp cloths. The flight toward the enemy was uneventful, though Sharaman was aware of the lengthening shadows of the hills and the silhouettes of their craft fleeing ahead of them over the rough ground. When they crested the last rise, the camp was still there, the tents of white cloth shining red in the light of the dying sun. In the center, glowing like an ingot, brooded the hulk of Mishra's war machine. Something struck Sharaman as wrong, but he could not put his finger on it immediately. He had little time to think of it, for Urza waved his wings in the attack signal. The six ornithopters broke into two groups of three. Sharaman led one, while Urza commanded the other. Urza's half of the flight activated their wings and beat to gain altitude, while Sharaman's banked and began a low bombing run over the camp. Sharaman locked his wings in gliding position and reached around for the goblin bombs. Without looking down, he heaved one after another over the edge of the ornithopter's canopy. These attacks were intended to frighten and disorient the camp natives. Real accuracy would be needed at the end of the bombing run when the target would be the Great War Hulk. There was no immediate response from the ground, and Sharaman looked ahead. The Great Metallic Wayne, some 50 feet in height, was looming ahead. They were dropping faster than Sharaman had anticipated, and Sharaman considered re-engaging the engine and gaining a bit more altitude before reaching the Hulk. Then the war machine opened fire, and his exact location was the least of Sharaman's problems. The war machine came alive as they neared. Windows slid open, and cupolas rotated to reveal bastillae, catapults, and other devices that Sharaman did not recognize. Something rose from the center of the war machine that looked like a great water pump, but instead of water, this last device spat fire. The air was filled with all manner of shot, stones, arrows, and huge ballista bolts. Sharaman slammed open the wing locks and engaged the engine, hoping to rise over the torrent of incoming missiles. He avoided the bulk of them, but one great ballista bolt, an arrow the size of a small tree, drove into his right wing. Worse yet, the bolt had a barbed head and did not pass through the wing entirely. Suddenly, the craft was pierced like a butterfly on a pin and weighted down. Sharaman was unable to stay aloft. The lieutenant cursed and hit the emergency disconnect lever to disengage the wing entirely. The lever was jammed by the force of the bolt's blow and would not budge. Sharaman looked around for something with which to pry it loose, aware that he was already losing altitude quickly. Then he saw the box of goblin bombs and cursed louder. The bombs would explode on contact, and if they were on board when he hit the ground, Sharaman ignored the release mechanism, having determined he was going to crash, but equally determined to not leave a huge crater in the process. He picked up the entire crate of bombs from its cradle and shoved it over the side of the craft's housing. He was horribly low now, for the bombs detonated almost immediately, striking the ground and sending up a wave of billowing black and red force. The force of the blow flipped the ornithopter upside down, and it crashed that way, sliding into one of the sunlit red tents. Sharaman guessed he could not have been out for more than a moment. The smell of flames brought him too. Breathing hurt his chest, and there was a numbness along his left leg. Still, he knew he had to get out before the flames reached him. Sharaman pulled himself from the wreckage slowly. His left leg could not take any weight. He pulled a small knife from his vest, ready for any of the phalaji who might suddenly attack, now that his wings were clipped. But there were no phalaji. The tent he had slammed into was empty. The only flames were those created by his own goblin bombs. That was what had bothered Sharaman when he was flying, he now realized. It was evening, but there had been no cooking fires. The camp was abandoned already. 
They left the war engine, he thought. He half stumbled, half hopped to a broken pole from the tent and used it as support. His initial attack had been a disaster. The only sign of his two fellow pilots were twin plumes of billowing smoke where the racks of goblin bombs had exploded upon crashing. He hoped the pilots had the presence of mind to jettison before they struck. Already, the second wave, led by Urza's white ornithopter, was pulling into position. Sharaman looked at the war machine. Why were there no people coming out to fight him? Were they all at their post? Then he realized there was no one in the camp at all, including at the war machine. The weapons were firing automatically, responding to some device the chief artificer's brother had crafted to detect and assault trespassers. They were fighting Ghost, and they were dying for it. Sharaman tried to wave off the attacking wing of the three craft, but Urza and the other pilots either ignored him or assumed he was one of the Falaji. As soon as they neared the war machine, the Great Wayne released another volley of bolts. Both Urza and one other pilot pulled their machines up in time to avoid the onslaught, but the third was not so lucky. It flew into a flurry of small arrow shot. The arrows were not enough to damage the craft, but they pierced the housing and killed its operator. The ornithopter pulled into a spiral to the right, a slow, deadly glide that was punctuated at the end with an explosion. The two other craft were still making for their target, the smaller craft in the lead. Sharman tried to understand why the Falaji would leave behind the mighty war machine unguarded, the engine that Misha had brought to Krug as a demonstration of his abilities. Unless it was a trap, he realized, all this was a stylized and ornate trap. Sharman shouted, but the lead craft was already dropping its load of goblin powder over the side. The first bomb struck the war machine, and the entire device detonated. The lead ornithopter was enveloped in flame, disintegrating in mid-flight. Sharman flung himself to the ground as bits of flaming metal rained down around him. When he looked up, Urza's was the only craft left in the sky. Its white wings were on fire now, and it trailed a banner of smoke. It made a beeline for the oversized rear wheel of the now-ruined war hull. The ornithopter struck the wane's wheel and evaporated in a great explosion as its double cargo of goblin bombs exploded. The great wane rocked, then slowly tumbled over on its side, its burning wreckage slamming into the desert sands. Among the smoking wreckage, framed by the fires of the great wane, a figure moved. Sharaman hobbled toward it, unsure if he should greet or battle the figure. It was Urza. His flying cloak was sinked and burning in several spots, and there were numerous cuts along the right side of his face. He clutched something to his chest something that glowed as brightly as an ember. Urza coughed into the burning sleeve of his other arm and then started to beat the sleeve against his leg, extinguishing the smoldering blaze. Trap, he said, as Sharaman reached him. Yes, sire, said Sharaman. Should have, another long, smoke-filled cough, should have seen it coming. He shook his head. Any others? Sharaman looked at the smoking plumes around the camp. I don't think so. We should go then, said Urza. Long walk back to camp. Longer walk back to Yodia. Sire. What? I'm afraid my leg's broken, said Sharaman. Despite everything, he felt embarrassed to mention it. Ursa's face twitched, as if Sharaman had mentioned some small niggling problem. Then his eyes cleared, and the chief artificer said, Of course. So it is. You rest here. I'll get some splints made. We'll check the other craft to see if there's any supplies, or perhaps a temple amulet among the wreckage then we'll walk back. As you wish, sire. Urza turned and regarded the smoking hulk with the war machine. He shook his head, and Sharman heard him say, Brother, why did you do this? Why the elaborate and costly ruse? Sharman wondered that as well. When they finally reached the Yodian borders weeks later, they would both know the answer. The attack came at dawn and was totally unexpected. Word had come that Urza's flight had failed to report in, and reluctantly, Tanos had dispatched the home flight to the north to aid in the search. That left only a single large training machine in the capital itself. Later, Tanos would wonder if dispatching the last organized flight had been the signal for the attack, if Urza's disappearance in the desert hadn't heartened the Kadir's troops for the assault, or if it had been Misha's plan to attack, regardless of what happened to Urza. Krug was bound on three sides by stout walls, and on the fourth by the Mardan itself, and it was across that great river that the desert dwelling Falaji came. Urza and Tanos and most of the rest of Krug had felt that any assault of the trans martin territories would be sufficient warning for the capital. To ensure their own safety, the Yodians had established a set of beacon towers along the far bank to give warning. It had not been enough, by strength or by trickery. The Flashy had overpowered the beacon tower guards in the dead of night, and by morning, they were ready with their assault. The morning was a foggy and wet one, the mist pulling over the Mardan itself. The river fishers, among the first ones up in the city, 
had the first and only warning. Beneath the lightning sky, as they were loading their nets into their boats and making ready to get underway, one of the crew shouted and pointed toward the center of the river. There were other craft already on the river, drifting toward the city docks. There were barges, rowboats, and hastily built rafts and ferries, stolen from upriver. They were loaded with men, armed men, with flowing ropes beneath their armor, curved blades, and wide brass hats. The river fishers were alone in their discovery only for a moment. The warning beacons across the river came to life, billowing great jets of flame into the sky, heralding the dawn. But the beacons were not set as warnings, but rather as declarations of war. Some of the fishers fled their boats, but others remained long enough to see the great serpentine heads of the dragon engines burst from the great waters of the Mardun and tower over Krug's docks. Grasping the shore with their front claws and churning the soft mud of the riverbank beneath the treads, the dragon engines waded into the city. There was the sound of a great machine inhaling, and the leading beast exhaled a torrent of liquefied fire. Behind it, the first wave of Falaji landed, bellowing war cries as they clambered onto the docks. The city of Krug was under assault. Tonos had been sleeping at the ornery, as he did often in these later days, when the runner came. The messenger was no more than a young girl and was frightened beyond belief. Tonos sent her to round up what students she could find from the barracks and tell them to ready every available avenger and the remaining ornithopter. And if he did not return before the palace was assaulted, the students were to use these devices in their own defense. Tonos dressed as he ran toward the royal quarters. The seneschal and the captain of the guard were already there, arguing with the queen. I am staying, she said. Already, she was beginning to show her pregnancy. Your majesty, for your own safety, begged the captain. As a temporary relocation, added the seneschal at the same moment. I am staying, said Kayla firmly. This is my home. She looked at Tanos. I want to stay. That may not be wise, said Tanos. Best prepare for flight now, and feel foolish about it later, said the captain. He asked, What is the situation? There was no warning, said the captain. Raph said the Falaji devils are coming downstream. More are pouring into the river wards all the time. The naval station and the fishermen docks were hit first. And there are dragon engines. Three at least. Maybe four. They seem to be leading the assault, spreading the destruction ahead of them. We've regrouped all the troops in the capital, but the people are blocking the streets. Open the gates, ordered Kayla. Let the people escape the city. But the enemy, objected the captain. Is already within our walls? Snapped Kayla. Do we need to sacrifice the people as well? The captain nodded. Tanos asked, How long before they reach here? The seneschal stuttered and spat. Th- there is no indication that they are- These are Mishra's engines, snapped Tanos, a new steel in his voice. Where else would they be heading? The captain thought for a moment, then said, An hour, two if we're fortunate. Is there anything you have on hand to help? I am working on it now, said Tanos. To Kayla, he said, Pack what you can carry. If it comes to this, we will need to flee. Kayla started to complain, and Tanos added, Take my advice this time. Please, prepare for the worst. Hope for the best. Have the matron help you. He looked around, suddenly noticing that the matron's impressive bulk was missing. Where is she? There was a silence for a moment. Then the seneschal stammered. She, she has a sister in the river wards. Said she was worried about her. Tanos' lips made a thin, grim line. Peck, he said. I'll be back. The students were already at the ornery when the chief apprentice returned. Five avengers were in working order, though each required an operator to stand close and give commands. Tanos assigned five of the oldest boys to take them and report them to the captain. He scribbled a hasty note to the captain that the boys should be kept together and used to fight the dragon engines. He added that if the Avengers fell, the boys were to flee the city as quickly as they could. There was only a single ornithopter ready, but it was a huge craft capable of carrying a fully armored Avenger easily. Tanos ordered the remaining boys to pack this craft full of Urza's notes and prototypes. One lad hesitated. He was one of the young ones in his first year of studies. Sir, are we going to fight? He asked. Tanos nodded. Yes, but we need to protect our knowledge. Get it to safety first. But, said the youth, sputtering, we can use the ornithopter to fight, can't we? Tanos looked down on the young man. Fight? How? We could drop bombs on them, but they are in our city, and we would be bombing our people. 
The Avengers will buy us time, but probably can't defeat the dragon engines by themselves. Do you understand? The boy looked at his feet. I suppose I would rather fight. Thanos looked at him grimly. And I would rather win the fight, he said. Do you understand the difference? Another pause, then... I suppose so. Good, said Thanos. Because you're going to fly the Ornithopter. If you have to fight, you will. But remember, the important thing is to get the Ornithopter, and particularly the books, away to one of the more remote bases farther east. If they have fallen, then head to Corlys, or even Argive. Do you understand? The boy nodded, and Thanos helped the youth load the Ornithopter. In the distance, there came the sound of explosions, and, once or twice, of shouting. Finally, the huge Ornithopter was loaded, and Thanos gave the lad the Jalum tome. As he took it, the boy said, My brother, he's another student here. Sandwell. Thanos hesitated. Do you want me to send him with you? He's one of the older students, said the boy. Thanos nodded slowly. He had sent the older students with the Avengers into battle. The boy said, If you see him, tell my left, and tell him not to worry. Your name is Rendo, right? Rendo, agreed the boy, set in the great book on his lap. I will tell him when I see him, Rendo, and the gods speed you, said Thanos. And gods help us all, he added to himself, as the boy engaged the power stone and the great craft came to life. The great ornithopter strained at its pulleys and leaped into the sky in a single bounce. It did not make the low climbing circle common in training flights. Instead, it flew arrow straight to the east. Behind it, there was the screech of the dragon engine that witnessed its departure. That made Thanos feel slightly better. If Misha was going to take Urza City, he's not going to take Urza's knowledge. He dismissed the rest of the students, telling them to take whatever they could carry and head east as quickly as possible, regrouping at the caravan town of Hench. And if that had fallen, he said, make for the coast or Corlys. He looked at their faces and knew that a few would go for weapons and join the melee, but enough would have the common sense to let the school survive. Thanos took Ashnod's staff from its holder and left the ornery for the last time, making for the guest wing. The guards were still at their position outside Ashnod's door. Thanos dismissed them, ordering them to help protect the palace. Hell of a party, said Ashnod as he entered. Pity we're missing it. Her words were light, but her face was drawn and concerned. I need your help, said Thanos. We need to get out of the city. We? asked Ashnod. Does that include me? I mean... These are my people coming to call. These are the Falashi, shouted Thanos. Do you think they could tell the difference between you and any other non falaji woman in the middle of the battle? If I have my staff, they will, replied Ashnod calmly. Give it to me. Promise to help, said Thanos. Promise to help me get the queen to safety, or if we're captured, guarantee her safety. Why should I help your precious queen, snapped Ashnod harshly. She's pregnant, said Thanos. I hope you don't think you're appealing to my motherly instincts, began Ashnod. Misra may be the father, interrupted Thanos. Do you want to tell him his child died in the taking of the city? Ashnod sat down. Woo, she said. Outside the window, there was an explosion, too close for Thanos' mind. Never even heard that rumor. Are you sure? Thanos looked at his hands. No. Ashnod shook her head and chuckled. Well, that's good enough for me. I promise to help get your precious queen away from here. Or if you're captured, to guarantee fair treatment. Can I have my staff now? Thanos hesitated for a moment and then gave her the staff. She ran her fingers over it and said, I expected you to dismantle it. I did, said Thanos, heading for the door. And I rebuilt it. Let's go. The hallways were empty now, and through the windows of the promenade, Thanos and Asha could see the rising plumes of smoke. Through it, far off in the city, Thanos saw a dragon engine. There was more than one, he said bitterly. Yep, said Ashnod. I told you, but you weren't paying enough attention. Maybe I should have given you to the priest, snarled Thanos. Then who would help you now? They ran into the queen and the seneschal at the entrance to the royal quarters. The seneschal was carrying a large carpet bag filled with the queen's personal effects. Ashnod looked at the queen's swelling belly. You have let yourself go, she said. Thanos asked. Status. The seneschal stammered and said, B-bad. The Avengers slowed the lead dragon engine. 
but it just pulled back and let the tribesmen overwhelm the adventurers and their operators. Some people think the queen has already left the city in an ornithopter. Tonos mentally kicked himself. It had not occurred to him to use the ornithopter to rescue the queen and not Urza's notes, or himself for that matter. We need to make haste, said the seneschal. The engines will be here any moment. The earth shook, and a deep fiery roar proved the seneschal wrong. The dragon engines had already arrived at the palace of Krug and were slamming their great shovel-like muzzles as battering rams against the walls. The hallway rocked, and half of it slid away, breaking apart under the assault of the engine. Stonework and furnishings suddenly collapsed as if a great blade had cut through the palace itself. In the wake of the cave-in, more of the hallway slid into a churning dust cloud. Tonos grabbed Kayla and pulled her close to him onto more solid ground. The seneschal was not so fortunate. The ground beneath him broke like brittle ice in the spring, and with a scream, he toppled forward into the abyss. Kayla shouted as the seneschal vanished into the churning debris, still clutching Kayla's carpet bag. Ashan lashed out an arm and grabbed Tonos' shoulder. Let's go. Her majesty can get new luggage later. Tonus's brows furrowed in anger, but there was no time for argument. The entire royal wing was slowly coming apart beneath the treads of the dragon engine. The beast screeched again, and the three, Ashnod, Tonos, and Kayla, fled down the hallway, away from the assault. They made it to the main entranceway before they ran to Falaji troops. An honor guard, noted Tonos briefly, from the look of their hats and carved gold epaulets. The three refugees were descending the main staircase when the desert tribesmen spilled into the hall beneath them. For a moment, both parties froze. Then, Ashnod took a step forward, down the stairs, and shouted, These people are under my protection. A large figure separated from the rest of the Falaji. This one was dressed in resplendent armor of tooled leather and was fat to the point of obesity. You are a woman. You cannot offer such protection. Ashnod stiffened, and Tanos realized that the two knew each other. I am the apprentice of Yoraki, O oh powerful one, she said, venom in her voice. I can do as I please. A pity, said the fat Falaji. Since in all the confusion, my men killed you before we knew who you were. I am afraid Misha will have to understand later. Ashan looked shocked. Why are you doing this? The fat one smiled. Misha depends on you, as a man leads on a crutch. My father once said that it's a bad thing for a man to have a crutch. I can do this to make Misha stronger. To his men, he said, Kill them all! Tana shouted and pulled his blade, pushing Caleb behind him. Ashnod screamed in obscenity and brought up her staff. The golden wired skull hummed and spat sparks. The Falaji soldiers did not make it farther than the bottom two steps. They went down, clutching their necks and bellies from the painful force of Ashnod's attack. Even behind her, Tonos could feel the intensity of the assault. Kayla huddled against him. The queen was muttering to herself, and Tonos realized that the words were prayers to one god after another. The soldiers collapsed in gasping piles, but Ashnod did not let up her attack. Instead, she turned her staff on the fat one, who had threatened her. The staff's tip glowed a brighter shade, and the wires incandescent, glowing from their own heat. The fat one clutched at his throat and spun around like a puppet, but Ashnod did not relent. Tonos could see blood spurting from the man's ears, nose, and eyes. When Ashnod finally lowered her staff, the fat one collapsed in a heap, dead among his unconscious soldiers, a puppet with his strings cut. Ashnod slumped as well, and Tonos reached out to steady her. She was bathed in cold sweat, and the thin trickle of blood streamed from her nose. I really, she said, rubbing the blood off her sleeve. I really have to fix the glitch in the staff's design. Tonos helped both women down the stairs, past the dead and unconscious men. He paused only slightly at the fat one, lying with his ruined face oozing blood. You knew this one? Ashan looked at the face of the dead Kadir of the Falaji. Some desert nobody, she said bitterly. Misha's better off with him gone. Kayla wanted to head east, join the refugees fleeing the city, but Ashnod took them westward instead, toward the docks. They were stopped by two Falaji patrols, but each time, these soldiers recognized Ashnod's claim that the two Yodians were under her protection. That was fortunate, thought Tanos, for Ashnod was nearly dead on her feet from the first battle and could not sustain another. They had passed through the front of the fighting now, and all that was left behind the advancing army was blackened devastation. What houses were not crushed by the engines had been set alight, and the flames guttered at every window. There was no one in the streets but the dead. Tanos found one of the Avengers, its legs removed by the Falaji, still flailing around in circles in the middle of one of the plazas. Taking a moment, Tanos deactivated it and removed the power stone. There was no sign of the device's operator. At last, 
they reached the docks. The quays were abandoned, like the rest of the city. Asnot chose one of the smaller of the attacking boats, still moored at the wharf. Here, she said. Get in. We should go east, said Kayla weakly. Ashnot shook her head. Misha's troops are going to be chasing refugees east for the next two weeks, looking for you, she said to Kayla, and turned to Tanos. And you, and anyone else connected with Urza, head south to the coast, then go east from there. Tanos helped Kayla over the gunwales of the rowboat. The Queen of Krug fled to the far end of the vessel and pulled her cape tightly around her. Tanos turned to Ashnod. You knew this attack was coming? He asked. I mean, now? Ashnod shook her head. If I did, and if I had told you, would you believe me? I've given you what you want. I'm going now. She clutched her staff tight, as if Tanos might try to take it from her. They might still kill you, the apprentice said. Less of a danger now. Trust me on that one, she said. If I find Misha, everything will be fine. You take care of Her Majesty. You really think she's carrying Misha's wealth? I don't know, said Tano softly. I'm not sure she knows either. Ashnod shook her head. Still playing the baby duck, even when the mommy ducks are heading for the abater. Your loyalty will put you in a spot someday where even I can't help you. Best of luck, duck. She kissed him quickly, but long enough for Kayla to observe. Then, with a wink and a wave, the scarlet-haired woman disappeared back into the burning city. Tanos watched until Ashnod vanished among the smoke and burning ash. Then he took the long pole and pushed the boat away from the docks into the main current of the river. The apprentice and the queen watched the city burn as they floated away from it and watched the smoke that marked its pyre long after the flanking hills hid the devastation from direct view. The rest of the journey for that day and for the next few days was in silence as they moved sluggishly down the river. The sense of loss and the responsibility for it weighed heavily on the occupants of the tiny craft.